You're listening to the Dental Zone podcast. I'm Dr. Rachel Hall. This is the place that supports you to understand your dental issues, the causes and how to prevent them, empowering each individual to get the most out of life while bearing a stunning smile. Hello, I'm Dr. Rachel Hall, holistic dentist from Brisbane, Australia. You can check us out on holisticdentistry.au. Thank you for joining me. This is the Dental Zone. Let's get to it and get in the zone. Today I'm going to be talking about airway, breathing disorders, snoring and sleep apnea. And you might be wondering what that has to do with dentistry. Well, last week I talked about TMJ disorders, clenching and grinding, misaligned bites. And you often see similar symptoms to TMJ that you do in people who have difficulty breathing when they're sleeping. And so that's why as a dentist, we like to to talk about these things. And as a dentist, I believe we're in a really good position to observe and visualize many of the signs in the mouth that can indicate if you have a problem breathing properly or difficulty breathing during your sleep. Now, look, I can't diagnose uh, an airway problem simply by looking at your teeth and mouth, but there are some telltale signs that can alert me to there being a problem. So to do this, I need to be able to understand and view the structures of your body that are working with and against each other. So why do airway and breathing disorders occur? Well, they happen because you've got obstructions in your airway. This can be due to a deviated septum. So that means your your nose is bent to one side. You can have narrow nasal passages, chronic allergies that make the insides of your nose swell. Um, You can be a mouth breather, a misaligned bite, having narrow jaws or a narrow throat, or it can be a combination of several of these things together. So essentially anything that limits or restricts your airflow is an airway disorder. So one of the most common causes of airway issues is there not being enough room in your mouth for your tongue. Now, your tongue should really, if it makes sense, fit properly inside your mouth. So I know that seems a bit odd and you'd think your tongue would naturally have all the room that it needs. Well, let's kind of think about this. It's like you've got a single car garage, that's your mouth, and you've got your car, which is your tongue, and they should be made to measure. But if you think about it, most garages are quite a tight squeeze and we start storing stuff in there and we pile things up against the wall and the sides and you know and we just manage to squeeze the car in you open the door and you squeeze yourself out but eventually you can end up with so much stuff in your garage you can't drive your car all the way in so if you were trying to park it you'd have to leave the door open because there wouldn't be room room to to close it now look if we relate that to back to you and how you breathe and your ability to breathe As time goes on, we collect stuff in our bodies and as we age, this stuff can cause inflammation and swelling of the soft tissues inside your mouth. So that's your tongue, your throat and the soft palate, which is the dangly bit at the back. And so you lose muscle tone as you age as well. Everything starts to head a bit south if you don't look after it. And that allows the muscles in your throat to collapse. So as the throat collapses, as you're lying back and sleeping, that's going to restrict your airflow. Um, You can also get bony outgrowths occurring in your mouth from clenching and grinding pressure and that's going to restrict the space for your tongue. And so it's like trying to park your car in that overstuffed garage. So just as you wouldn't park your car and leave your garage door wide open, we don't walk around with our tongue hanging out of our mouth, no. We have to force it back into our mouth and tuck it away so that we look normal. So that means instead of your tongue sitting nice and flat, It's actually cramping itself up and sitting further back inside your mouth, which means it's closer to the back of your throat, which restricts airflow because there's not enough room between it and the roof of your mouth and not enough room between the back of the tongue and your throat. So everything's tucked in. So as I said, you wouldn't walk around like that because your tongue doesn't have enough room. So you've got your car jammed right up against all your stuff and that means you get blocked up. Now, that's what's happening in your mouth and you can live without noticing that until it gets bad and you have to take action. But if you've already got an issue with there not being enough tongue space or a limited airway 
jaw to um, due to poor facial growth or jaw growth, then that process of muscle collapse and inflammation it quickly is going to become a serious and potentially life threatening issue. So. We shouldn't um, take it for granted if we can't breathe correctly through our nose or we struggle for air. So what does that mean? It means when your airway gets blocked or obstructed when you lie down and that interferes with your sleep. So proper sleep and sleep quality are a major key for your body to be able to rest and regenerate and repair itself. It's part of your healing processes. It helps reduce inflammation and the damage from that. So it helps you recuperate from the stresses of, of the day. And lack of sleep is actually a killer. Lack of sleep or proper deep sleep is going to lead to inflammation. So if your airway blocks um, while you're sleeping, at best you're gonna snore. And worse, it's actually gonna fully obstruct. And that's like being strangled or suffocated. And it's not just happening once or twice, it can be happening many, many times a night, several times a minute, over and over, hundreds or even thousands of times. Now, that obstruction can sometimes be two, three, four, five, six seconds, 10, 20, and sometimes it can be a minute or more each time. So you imagine holding your breath for a minute and doing that over and over again. So as you can imagine, that's not gonna be doing you any good as you gasp and choke for air. Now, obstructive sleep apnea, or as we term it, OSA, snoring and related sleep breathing conditions will cause that lack of deep quality sleep. But it's not like insomnia. It's not like you're lying there awake and knowing you can't sleep. These conditions stop you going into a deep restful phase of sleep and getting that quality sleep and falling into the deep levels that you need to feel rested and refreshed. So whilst you might not actually remember waking up or being fully woken up, your body is being aroused from your sleep state. So you're only staying in like that version of light sleep, you know, the, the sort that, that happens when you're falling asleep or getting ready to wake up. This means that the majority of people are totally oblivious to the fact that they've got a sleep breathing issue and because they think they've been sleeping. And not only that, they often think they've slept well. But if you don't know what normal is, then your normal sleep seems like a good night's sleep and you think that everyone's the same. Sleep deprivation is serious. It's not just about you feeling tired and a bit rough. It's cumulative, so it's gonna to lead to poor performance um, during your work. It's gonna give you daytime sleepiness and it, it does really dramatically increase your risk for falling asleep at the wheel while you're driving. So without proper sleep, you can't take care of you. It's really an essential part and a very neglected aspect of our health and well-being. And it's crucial to every aspect of our lives. And I know like a lot of people now, they're staying up very late and they're not getting enough sleep and they're not resting during their sleep because they're feeling stressed and wound up, which is a, a, a different reason why you're not sleeping, but it is still as detrimental and having the same impact. So with sleep breathing issues, it means you can wake frequently and you need to get up more to go to the toilet, you go to pee a lot. Um, your sleep partner might tell you that you snore or even witness that you stop breathing or that you're struggling for breath during your sleep. You can sometimes wake yourself up gasping for breath and feeling very anxious because of it as well. And these are all warning signs for sleep apnea. Now, if you snore, that's 70% predictive for you having sleep apnea or developing it as you age. So it's a serious problem. You know, it's a serious airway problem. Now, obstructive sleep apnea has to be diagnosed with a sleep study by a sleep physician, which is a doctor with special interests in this area and sleep disorders. So I can't diagnose it, but as a dentist, I am well positioned to be able to examine your mouth, teeth, jaws, and airways. Um, I do that visually. I can also do it via special x-rays, um, which along with your health history and asking the right questions can help me spot the warning signs and the risk factors for an airway issue. So if you suspect that you or your partner or one of your family members or even your children 
have a sleep breathing issue, I'd request that you would go and order a sleep study via your GP. Now, we were always told, and this is only sleep sleep, sleep disorders haven't been studied that greatly in medicine. It's quite a new area. Our understanding around sleep studies and sleep apnea is quite limited and the understanding is that there are many, many people with sleep breathing disorders and it's not being diagnosed. And so we need to understand what the risk factors are and how to look for these things. So in obstructive sleep apnea, your brain is actually telling you to breathe. It's saying, come on, you've got a blockage, there's not enough airflow coming through here. And then your breathing stops, like I said, for 10, 20, 30 seconds or even more, a minute or even longer. And these episodes of being breathless are called apneas. And they happen many times during the night. You're suffocating and you're being starved of oxygen. And that's happening throughout the night. So you can imagine that this can't be a good thing. So sleep apnea is commonly accompanied by snoring, 70% indicative that you have sleep apnea, yet not everyone with sleep apnea will snore. So we used to think that sleep apnea affected overweight men who drank. Now, you don't have to be overweight to have sleep apnea, and you don't have to be old either, or male. You can actually be young and thin and look very fit and have sleep apnea or have a sleep breathing issue. So the snoring that occurs is caused by narrowing of your upper airway and that causes a vibration of your throat tissues and that's considered to be a partial obstruction of your airway whereas a sleep apnea is a full obstruction or a total blockage. Now I know that we think snoring is quite humorous and it's a bit funny but actually it's no laughing matter because sleep apnea is a serious problem. So why is that? Well, if you have sleep apnea, you're not getting enough air during your sleep. You've got an increased risk, therefore, of inflammation, and that leads to an increased risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, um, problems with your lungs, congestive heart failure, and coronary artery disease. So in other words, sleep apnea is a serious life-threatening condition and it should not be ignored or taken lightly. Now, people get diagnosed and the gold standard is to put them on a CPAP machine, which is a, a special device that pushes air into your nose and throat while you sleep. But that means you've got to have a big mask on or a nose piece and a tube connected to a machine. So a lot of people are being diagnosed, they're being prescribed a CPAP machine, and because they hate wearing it, they don't use it. So we've now got all these people walking around knowing they've got a problem, but not doing anything to support themselves to minimize the impact. Along with these conditions that I've mentioned, like high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, etc. People with sleep breathing disorders will also have day, excessive daytime sleepiness, so they'll not off at the traffic lights or reading a book. Um, they can fall asleep at the wheel. Not sleeping well also causes you to have memory issues because while you sleep, your brain's consolidating your memories. Um, you can often have frequent headaches, lethargy and low energy. You can be irritable and moody. Um, you be, can gain weight or, or you have the ability, inability to lose weight. People will often wake with a dry mouth or a sore throat or a headache on the morning that then clears up during the day. And more often than not, they will grind the living daylights out of their teeth. So there's a massive issue here. There's the number of people with obstructive sleep apnea that are undiagnosed because we're not picking up on the, on the, the underlying reasons. Sorry for the health issues and the symptoms that I've mentioned. So you go with high blood pressure, you put on a blood pressure medication, that doesn't help. You put on another blood pressure medication. Now I was taught when I did my sleep study courses and sleep apnea and sleep disorder um, research is that if you've got someone who's on two or three high blood pressure medications and it's still not being controlled, that is a big red flag for sleep apnea. And so we need to be working together as dentists and, and the medical profession to actually start looking at these things and going, why is that person having this health issue and not just 
giving them a medication. Yes, we need to support their health and wellbeing, but we need to find out if there's something we can do to make a change. So one of the biggest giveaways for me is that I see massive wear and destruction on the teeth, thickened deposits of bone around the roots of the teeth and along the jaw bones. And this is because when your airway obstructs, your brain signals your jaws and teeth to clench together because this helps pull the tongue and the throat muscles off the back of the, the throat in an attempt to increase or restore their airflow. So you've got this thing going on, you stop breathing, grip your teeth together, that helps the flow again. Then you stop breathing, grip your teeth together. And so you can see that this is like having a, a jackhammer, whacking your teeth together every night, trying to keep you breathing. Yet as a dentist, if you don't understand that that's a sign of sleep apnea, then you're just treating someone for clenching and grinding and you're not actually helping them. When you have sleep apnea, there are two things that are happening or going wrong in your body. You don't get enough sleep because you're having to wake up to breathe and you're not getting enough oxygen for your system because you stop breathing. Now, the common treatment, as I mentioned before, is the device called a CPAP machine. Now, CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And that delivers a steady flow of air via a nose piece or mask and that supports to push the airway open. And as I mentioned, the problem is many, many people don't like wearing it, they can't get used to them, so they simply don't bother and hence their condition goes untreated and, and will get worse. So when you get a sleep study done, you usually go into a sleep clinic, they wire you up, they're reading your brain waves, they're reading um, your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, uh, oxygen flow. They can even measure for sounds of clenching and grinding and snoring. And they'll often do it in the center and you have a technician there watching after you and seeing whether you slept on your back or your side and so forth. You can also do a home study. Um, they're not as accurate because you're having to set yourself up during that. Um, and there are new things that are coming out um, and have been shown to be very effective where it, we can even get disposable sleep studies done now. So it's just a little device that goes over your nose with a sensor that goes, I think, on your forehead and it has a chip in it that you can then pop into a, a software program and outcome all the readings and they're showing very promising results and I'd really like to have those here. Uh, it's ironic or maybe uh, no, no coincidence that today and, and during this week Nearly every patient that I've seen, we've been talking about snoring and sleep apnea and the signs that they're showing in their mouth and, and asking people to go get the sleep studies done. So it's very, very prevalent. And once you understand what the warning signs are, you can't help but see them in your patients and you wonder how you missed them previously. Uh, it, it is one of my pet subjects. I really Once I started to understand the significance and the difference that we can make in people's lives, as dentists, I just had to run with this and I had to learn more and help my patients to, to better understand what's going on and help them live a healthier and longer life. So sleep apnea is graded as mild, moderate and severe. The higher you are up on the scale, the greater the damage is being done to your body and hence your health. So if you're mild, you stop breathing a few times. If you're severe, you, you, you stop breathing a lot. Um, and the issue here is that we have a range. So if your readings fall just below that range, they say, yep, you don't have sleep apnea. You're told that everything's fine and that you don't have it, even though you actually are having episodes where you stop breathing. However, just because they say, oh, you only stop breathing this many times during an hour, doesn't mean that that's normal or healthy. Um, and should we be addressing that? And there is no guideline for that. In my opinion, if you're stopping breathing in your sleep, that's not a good thing and we have to do something about it. So what I find is that dental issues will surface before you hit that magic number that says you have sleep apnea. And these dental issues include things like fractured and broken teeth, uh, dentistry that fails quickly, so um, gum disease, bone loss caused by the physical overload of clenching the teeth to get the airway open, increased rates of tooth decay 
even though essentially you're keeping your mouth clean and healthy and you're not eating the foods that are supposed to be causing cavities. One of the other things that happens is you get a pH imbalance now. That means you become more acidic. But because of the way the sleep apnea is being classified, you're left with this ongoing problem because you've been told everything's okay, it doesn't exist, you don't have a problem, no more intervention or treatment required. But no, you're not normal. So, you know, you, what are you going to do? You're just going to keep getting on with your life until your next tooth breaks. And you keep blaming your dentist for doing shoddy dentistry or... You know, I don't know. I mean, I see that a lot when people come in, they've just got busted teeth and busted fillings and no one's asking why. They're just patching them up, patching them up, patching them up and going, oh, come on, there's, there's a message here. The body's telling you something. So are you going to carry on, just keep breaking teeth or wait till you seem to be grasp, gasping for breath at night or worse, you're going to suffer a stroke or a heart attack from having low oxygen? So why do we need sleep? Uh, we need sleep for several reasons, including repair and restorations. And we need to have a steady flow of oxygen at all times. A night when we sleep and our muscle tone is much lower, that's gonna make your throat much more prone to collapsing. The healthier you are, the greater your muscle tone is going to be during the night and the less chance you are of having that airway collapse. Now, like you can exercise your arms and legs and your abs, you can exercise your throat and apparently singing is quite good for that. So when my son's telling me to shut up, I'm telling him I'm doing my airway exercises so that I can get away with it. So lack of oxygen is going to alter your body pH. Now we should essentially be around 7.4 as humans. So that means we're tending to slightly alkaline. Now if that drops and it becomes more acidic, the feedback systems in your body are reading that and they go, hang on, we've got, to, we've got to do something. We've got to buffer ourselves back and bring our blood back to within a normal range. So this is going to involve pulling alkalizing minerals from your bones immediately to bring your um, blood pH back to balance. Now, when that pH is constantly up and down, up and down, up and down, from that lack of oxygen, it stresses your entire body. It depletes it of the minerals that it needs to function and it makes you sick. So how does it make you sick? It's causing stress, acidity and inflammation. And so that in conjunction with struggling not to breathe properly every night and low oxygen is gonna trigger your flight, um, fight flight response. So you're wired and you're constantly on the go. You're going to have high cortisol levels. That's going to affect your immune system, your metabolism, and eventually you're going to just burn out. Like TMJ disorders, sleep apnea takes its toll on your body because every day this accumulative stress is adding up. So studies have found that sleep apnea causes so much damage to your body that it can shorten your life by many, many years, as well as drastically reducing the quality of life as well. Now, I had a patient who I'd been seeing um, recently, um, probably about 18 months ago, she first came in as a patient. She'd got eight or nine cracked teeth, really bad gum disease, high decay rates. She looked gray, very exhausted and she shared with me that she thought she was getting dementia because she couldn't remember anything and she felt really depressed and so she'd come to me to get her amalgam fillings replaced well I had an examination of her and I agreed that that would be beneficial um, essentially as well because many of her teeth were cracked and needed working on but the first thing I did is ask her if she'd have ever had a sleep study now she told me that She'd had one in the past and it had come back that she'd got uh, mild to moderate sleep apnea, if I remember rightly, and her GP had just told her to go lose weight. So I gritted my teeth and bit my tongue and just gently suggested maybe she go to see another GP, get another study done. So we went through that and we got her dental work done I started a treatment because she was having some difficulties and pain. We started removing her amalgams and uh, rebuilding her teeth. And she came in one day and I said to her, what have you been doing different? And she said, oh, 
I went and saw another doctor and here's my sleep study results. She was severe, really severe um, sleep apnea. And so about three weeks previous to seeing me, she'd been put on a CPAP machine and she came in, she was full of energy, she was chatty, um, her pallor had completely changed. She looked really healthy and uh, she said that her ability to recall things and remember her just boom, come straight back. So this is the huge life changing difference getting a proper diagnosis and treatment could make. So it doesn't take much to change your airway. So if that's your tube there, and that's your airway, if you suffer a loss of half that size, then what you actually need to push air through your windpipe is a 16 fold increase in pressure to deliver the same amount of oxygen flow. So the narrower that tube gets, the greater the resistance to the airflow becomes. So little changes in your airway can cause big, big, big impact on your health and well-being and ability to breathe. But conversely, this means a small obstruction can be corrected quite easily. So hang on, I just lost my train of thought there. Let me go back because I don't think I quite said that right. So the narrower the tube gets, the greater the resistance to the airflow is. So little changes in that airway are going to give big results. So it means a small obstruction can cause great difficulties in breathing, but on the flip side, this is what I was trying to say, a small increase in size in your airway will give dramatic improvements. So how do we diagnose sleep apnea? Well, as I said before, as a dentist, I'm not allowed to diagnose you with it. Um, I can organise for you to go and get a sleep study via your GP, but I can spot those warning signs. So by examining your teeth, your jaws, your mouth and throat, and taking a thorough health and sleep history. So it's interesting that dentists are actually now considered to be the best place to detect the telltale signs of snoring and sleep apnea, and also to treat them, because we're able to provide prosthetic devices that you wear at night that position your jaw to create and maintain the most open airway while you sleep. Now, the treatment depends on your severity of your conditioning. And when it's very severe, a CPAP machine is, is the gold standard. And essentially, when we can't cure your condition fully, but we can manage it. One of the common treatments that we can do as dentists to help improve the airway is to look to fix the narrow airway and tissue collapse by reducing the amount of obstruction that they create. So a common uh, treatment is the use of a dental appliance that works on the premise that we can control the posture of your jaw or your tongue and then that can improve the volume of air that's entering your airway. Now there are a vast array of oral devices on the market uh, and if you google them they're online it's like just buy it one size fits all. Well I never recommend you buy an over-counter one-size-fits-all device. The goal is to help you breathe at night and that device needs to be custom made and optimally positioned to give you the most benefit and results. Now, if we just randomly stick a big piece of plastic in your mouth uh, and it's ill-fitting or has your jaw incorrectly positioned, it can and will cause more harm. And it can worsen your number of apneas by over 50%. Well, you might be wondering why that is, and that's because your appliance is taking up more room. And it's taking up room in your mouth and cramping your tongue up worse, worse than it was before. So now it's got even less room and it's going to push further back inside your mouth and push up harder against the roof of your mouth, and it's going to make it harder for you to breathe. But a custom, well-made and well-positioned device that's tailor-made to suit it's highly individualized to the specific needs of your body and the shape of your jaw and where everything needs to sit to give you the best results. So not all dental sleep appliances are the same because no two people are the same. They need to be made to measure based on the anatomical considerations, what's gonna be required to maximize the airway. Also, what position is the jaw best in? So it's not gonna stress this jaw joint and what's going to be best suited for comfort and wearability. 
Now, when I first started learning about sleep apnea, the devices are all based on pushing your lower jaw out as far as possible. So you've got this sort of thing going on. Now, all that's doing is pulling and pulling on all the tendons and ligaments and muscles here in your jaw joint, and it can actually create much more difficulty with any underlying TMJ issues, which is the name for the jaw joint there. Also, I don't know if I can do this on video, is if you're only sliding things forward, are you actually creating more volume? Do we actually need to be separating the upper and lower jaw further to get more airflow? And that to me makes more sense than doing, hang on, back this way, this sort of thing, where we can actually just move the lower jaw slightly forward, open the jaws apart, and give the tongue more space. So occasionally you'll see people where they've got obstacles in the airways that need to be removed. So these can be bony growths in the jaws, um, polyps in the nose, in large tonsils, or jaws that are very narrow and they need orthodontic expansion or treatment to, to able to expand those and get more room. Or if you've got a deviated septum or narrow nostrils, they sometimes need to be treated to increase the nasal airflow. The main treatment, just to recap, is for oral sleep, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, is the CPAP machine and or a dental appliance. But being as, you know, we're holistic and we want to take a holistic approach, what other things can you do to help yourself? Now, one of the best things you can do is to modify your lifestyle. And this includes a fat management program. So the goal is to reduce your body fat percentage and lose some weight. This will often see improvements that reduce or reverse sleep apnea in a lot of people. But also, you know, there's going to be additional benefits to this. So bringing your blood sugars back down, dealing with the triglycerides, which are the fats that you can get clogging up your arteries and bringing those back to normal levels and reducing inflammation. And I just wanted to say again that the, it's a myth that it's only overweight old men who get sleep apnea. We actually see um, airway issues in childhood and they're at high risk of becoming adults with sleep apnea. You can also have children who have sleep apnea and they'll be gasping for breath. They tend to wet the bed and not stay dry and actually not get dry until they're much older. Um, they'll also have things like night terrors, which can be indicative of a sleep apnea problem. So these children who have airway issues when they're young will grow up to have airway disturbance and often a lot of systemic problems and issues with their health as well. What happens is when a child can't breathe properly through their nose, so be that like from allergies um, like hay fever and rhinitis or large enlarged tonsils, what they do is they will try and overcome the compromised airway. So they'll make postural adaptations so that they can breathe better and draw more air. And these are made worse by, by age. So what tends to happen is we develop this head forward posture to open the airway up and you'll see them walking around like to get air in. And so many of these children actually have recurrent tonsil problems ear infections, allergies, um, hay fever, and they'll often have a retruded or very small lower jaw. You know, um, what we say in England is that they don't have a chin. Um, to compensate and get enough air, they're going to develop that head forward posture to open the airway and they're going to mouth breathe. Now, when you mouth breathe, you're breathing in unfiltered air. So you're taking in all the dust and particles that your nose is supposed to filter out. Those dust and particles irritate the lungs and cause more inflammation. That head forward posture is also placing an enormous amount of pressure on the cervical spine here in the neck and it leads to problems with neck pain, shoulder pain, um, lower back and even hip and knee problems and would you believe it, flat feet. So that mouth um, forward and head posture, sorry, mouth open and head forward posture means that the tongue sits too low in the mouth and the shape of the jaws becomes altered. The tongue should actually at rest be sitting right tucked up inside of the roof of the mouth. 
Without that happening, the jaws don't grow properly or fully. But if this is addressed early, it can be corrected so that it, it avoids um, having to have orthopaedic problems or airway issues later in life. So if we can catch this early and correct it, we can actually provide airway orthodontics. So we're not just looking at creating nice, straight, even teeth and giving them an attractive smile. What we're trying to do is maximise the growth so you get a good width in both the upper and lower jaw, and that's going to improve the head and neck posture and the airway, their breathing and their facial development as well as their speech development as well. So the most common problem we get to see is underdeveloped jaws, both the upper and the lower, and this presents as crowding in the baby teeth and in the new adult teeth as they are up. So traditionally, the answer for crowded teeth was for the dentist to actually say, ooh, you've got more teeth than you need. Your jaw's too small. Let's take some teeth out. Now, that's actually the worst possible solution because what it does is it actually collapses the jaw and makes it even smaller. So the answer is not to do that. The answer is to grow the jaw in width and length and height to accommodate the teeth. Nature doesn't get it wrong. It's because we're not growing properly that this happens. So as I was just saying, the traditional answer for crowded teeth was for the dentist to remove them, which makes the jaw smaller, when really what we should be doing is looking to grow the jaw, get as much width, length and height as possible. Now that can be done with orthopaedic appliance, that develop the size of the jaw much more to its ideal shape. Now this may take time, and it means your child's got to wear an appliance and be diligent with it. But this gives a much better end result and it's easier to do while kids are little and their bones are still soft and growing. Hey Russell, great to see you. Thanks for joining live. So essentially what needs to happen is we don't need to take teeth out. We need to enlarge the jaw so the teeth fit and they bite together correctly and the tongue and the airway are not compromised. So having a, an efficient and open airway is going to go a long way to supporting your oral health and your overall health. If you're not breathing properly and you're inflamed, you are much more likely to have advanced gum disease, um, high rates of tooth decay, high, weight, high rates of tooth fracture and problems with your jaw joint. So if you're experiencing tiredness, short-term memory issues, you're getting regular headaches, especially when you wake up, you kind of wake up with a headache or with pain here across your face or your eyeballs feel like all fuzzy. Um, if you're getting a sore throat or a dry mouth when you wake up on the morning or you're waking frequently at night, you're getting up to um, urinate frequently and you don't feel rested or refreshed when you wake up, these are all signs that you could have sleep apnea. If you snore or you've been told you struggle for breath during your sleep, I am gonna strongly urge you to get your airway and your sleep breathing assessed because it might just save your life. Sleep apnea and TMJ issues do go hand in hand. So if I see someone with signs of clenching and grinding and uh, TMJ symptoms, so pain in the joints and face, and headaches and neck problems, I will always start asking myself, does this person have sleep apnea? Does this person have a breathing disorder? And if I suspect that they do, then I will send them for the screening x-rays to check their airways and also for a sleep study. Well, thank you very much for listening to the Dental Zone podcast today. I'm Dr. Rachel Hall, holistic dentist from Brisbane, Australia. Next week, I'll be talking about gum disease, what it actually is, what causes it, what impact it has on your health and well-being, and what you can do to prevent it. Thank you for being in the zone. You've been listening to the Dental Zone podcast with Dr. Rachel Hall. For health, lifestyle, fitness, and a great smile, get in the zone.